are talking about the all-new Viveza 3 dual palette, well, interface, and um, some of the great new features built into the software. Um, you know, it's brand new, and uh, I've been playing with it with the software for maybe a month or so, I think, I don't know, a couple weeks at least, and uh, I every time I open it, I find sort of new and slightly different ways of utilizing some of these really cool new features. This is what we're talking about today. So we're jumping into the latest version of Viveza. It's the um, uh, light and color adjustment tool. And there's all sorts of new stuff in here, which gives us even more and different control over our photo post-processing. Uh, now, we will uh, discuss the presets, how to use the presets, uh, how to create your own presets. If you are already familiar with the rest of the Nick suite, you're likely familiar with presets, silver effects, uh, color effects has uh, the ability to create recipes. Um, even Sharpener Pro has the ability to create presets. It works almost the same way. The interface does look a little bit different, so I'll make sure to show you that stuff. Um, but it's really nice to have that added into a Viveza. Uh, we'll walk through the interface. We will talk about control points and some of the new added capabilities built into the control points, the white balance tool, and then the color select tool, uh, which seems even better than it was in the previous version of the software. So those are basically what we're going to be covering today. And um, I know that there's a wide variety of folks in this webinar right now. There are folks who've used the software for years. There's folks who've used it a little bit over maybe the past year or so. There's folks who are brand new uh, to the Nick collection. And so um, as we talk about these things, I wanna talk to all of you, but I wanna make sure everybody has a good experience. So I'm gonna walk folks through sort of the, the interface and the kind of base use for Viveza, or at least my idea of um, some of the tools that you can utilize within uh, Viveza. Now, we're not doing these things in a vacuum, of course. Uh, we are dealing, some folks might be using the Nick collection as standalones. I'm gonna be using it as presets, or not presets, what am I talking about, plugins. And um, we're gonna be launching the software from Photolab 4 today, as well as from Photoshop um, to discuss a couple slightly different things. And uh, the first image here, I've got it open in Photo Lab. This is a photograph of the New York State Museum in Albany, New York. I was there scouting for um, some, some photo shoots that we're hoping to do actually in a couple years now. And um, uh, basically, it was a beautiful night and I had this opportunity to shoot a long exposure um, image here. Uh, and it's, I, I like how it turned out. It was the right time of day to make this photograph. And I wanna be able to, to massage the tones and adjust them a little bit. And so we're gonna do that within Viveza 3. Before I went into, or before we go into Viveza 3, I have done a few things here within uh, our, our raw processor. I've cropped the image. I've got um, the denoising technologies on. We've got smart lighting on here within Photolab. I made a white balance adjustment. And I think I made a perspective. I definitely made a perspective adjustment here because I didn't have a tripod at the time. I put the camera down. Anyways, long story short, I am making some adjustments here within the raw processor. And then we're gonna launch into uh, Viveza, which let's go ahead and do that. To access the Nick plugins from Photolab, you move into the lower right corner of the Customize section, if you're within the Customize section of Photolab, and uh, you click the Nick Collection button. You can see my cursor down here in the lower right. I'm gonna click on that, and a plugin selector pops up. Now, usually we can just move into the Nick Collection we might want to utilize and click on it and it opens and we can work with it. But before we do that, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to make sure that my settings are set properly because I do change these settings from time to time. So let's just go ahead and open them by clicking the settings button. Uh, they actually look like they're fine, uh, but let's just run through these very quickly. So because we're dealing with a, a non-destructive raw processor, that is Photolab 4, um, when we're utilizing the Nick plugins as a plugin, from Photolab, uh, we are going to be making a duplicate image 
of our original RAW, which means this image down here in our film strip in the bottom portion of the interface, that's a RAW file, and we're gonna make a duplicate. And what's gonna happen right now is that we're gonna be able to do it as a TIFF file. We're gonna be able to make a TIFF file um, from the RAW file, right? There are some options here. I do suggest, especially if you're going to make um, you know, dramatic adjustments to your photos, that you use the TIFF file extension, TIFF file format, and uh, you use the 16-bit cha per channel. It's, you're just gonna yield a better quality image you know, overall. Okay, I'm not gonna jump into all of these other things, but resolution, you know, whatever, it's, whatever the default is is fine, 240 or 300 is fine. Um, we don't have to worry about resizing because we're not going to resize this image. We don't have to worry about watermarks because we're not going to add a watermark in this case. And then the ICC profile, I think the default might be set to sRGB. Um, in our case, it, it won't matter because we're doing this for uh, demonstration purposes, but these are good uh, knowing and understanding how those color spaces work. That might be some homework for folks if you're not already familiar with how sRGB and Adobe 1998 what those things mean and how they work. Um, you don't have to go way in depth. It's just good to know which one's good for what. And in this case, I've just got it on sRGB because it really doesn't matter for what we're doing um, for this webinar. It's just a demonstration. So I'm gonna click OK. Uh, we're gonna click on Viveza 3. And what's gonna happen is Photolab is going to take our image that we've made our adjustments to. Photolab will duplicate the image and Viveza will open with that 16-bit uh, per channel duplicate photograph. Now, um, once that launches, we're actually going to see a prompt come up that is saying that we're working or we can work in a non-destructive workflow. And that's what this little prompt is that just popped up. So, um, by the way, I, I have to leave or I do leave all of these prompts that come up as warnings on. Uh, for our demonstrations. Once you know what's happening here, you know the fact that um, you know this is a TIFF file and we can work in a non-destructive process, you can actually click on the little checkbox that's to the left and click the OK button and this won't pop up anymore until you update or reinstall your software and you just have to do that again. Um, but anyways, this prompt is saying that because we're working as a TIFF file, we can work in a non-destructive post-processing workflow by moving into the lower right corner and clicking this little checkbox on. Uh, the benefit of that is if we ever want to open our image, our processed image back up into Viveza, we can easily do that and we can reprocess the image. We can pick up where we left off. It's a really nice uh, feature that's been built into the last couple versions of um, the Nick collection here. All right, welcome to Viveza 3, ladies and gentlemen. We are here now and uh, we're gonna start by talking about this preset dialog that's over here on the left-hand portion of our interface. Uh, and it's, it's relatively straightforward. There are 10 presets that are gonna be built into the software. Uh, the first one is neutral. So if you ever just wanna reset your image back to the original default, you've got neutral, but then you've got golden hour and blue hour and remove color cast and these really nice presets that can yield you a nice perspective or a nice, uh, I guess just a, a different way of looking at your image. Or if you create your own looks, you can save your own presets now with Viveza, which is pretty awesome. So let's click on golden hour. I'm gonna move over to that left-hand side of the interface, click on golden hour. A little prompt is gonna come up saying that adding this preset, whatever, whenever you click on a preset, it's gonna basically set all of the adjustment sliders that are over here on the right-hand side of the interface. So we're just gonna say yes. I'm actually gonna hit enter uh, because that prompt is gonna pop up every time. Um, and I, I to, again, I'd like to do that because anytime I do these webinars, I wanna make sure everybody um, you know, knows what's happening as we click through these things. So that's the golden hour preset. Here's blue hour. So it basically shifts the color and the uh, white balance to emulate a, a, a blue hour sort of hour of um, shooting or hour of you know, before the end of the day or at the very beginning of the day. Remove color cast, we click on fill light, You'll actually see, when I, as we click on these presets, by the way, what's happening is uh, a different set of adjustment sliders are being utilized over here on the right-hand side of the interface, which we're gonna get into all of these, by the way, over here on the right. But uh, let's, let's take a look at these. I, I think that they're relatively straightforward. Um, 
one of the brand new features though within uh, the in Viveza 3 is that you can easily save control points into your preset, right? And so this is really nice because you might be taking lots of portraits um, and you might want to use something like number seven, which is sharpen eyes, which comes with two preset, or sorry, two control points, which have preset adjustments on them with the idea of um, being a good starting point for uh, sharpening eyes, right? So this is really cool because you can go in and um, we can augment these and change them. You know, obviously we're not on a portrait right now, so it's not totally useful, but you can get an idea of the fact that A, we can save control points into presets now, directly into it, I'll show you it. And then B, you can think about using Viveza 3 in a different way than how we had to use Viveza 2, right? Because there are these new features like presets with control points or presets for that matter with Viveza, now we can streamline, now we can utilize the software in a different way than before. Long story short, Let's go back up to the top here, click on neutral. We're just gonna reset the image. And uh, let's walk through a couple of the facets of the interface, right? So um, if you follow my cursor into the sort of top toolbar here, uh, folks who use perspective effects, which is the, the, the um, newest sort of brand new addition to the Nick collection that DxO has developed and created for us, Nick users, um, this interface will actually feel similar to that, right? Of course, in, in Viveza, we are dealing with adjustments of light and color. In perspective effects, we're dealing with uh, controlling distortion and controlling perspective and those sorts of things. So the tools palette on the right is different, but the tool bar on the top section is very similar. Now, I can't show you the compare buttons. I'm not gonna do anything really because I haven't made any changes and I've clicked on the neutral preset. But your zoom functionality does look different, works different than a previous versions of Viveza. Um, you've got fit and fill. So fit screen and fill screen, right? You've got one-to-one, -one, so we can actually um, click one-to-one -one and you can see some ducks uh, and you can see a little bit of camera shake. I probably moved um, as we were shooting this, but I've. I've clicked on one to one and now we're uh, yielded with a full resolution image. Two to one, right? We can zoom even further in. Now we're going to be a little pixelated. Um, but then you also have a custom and you can go in and adjust this. So right now we're at two to one, but maybe I want to see the image at, you know, one to four. So that we're zoomed in a little bit, but maybe not all of the way. When you click on those arrows, that's to the right of that far right zoom um, uh, ratio there you're able to click on that and change it. And then that stays sticky as well. So if, especially if there's a, a zoom level that you like um, for you know maybe lots of different images, you can kind of leave that there and that does remain sticky. It's really quite nice. I'm gonna hit fit screen, right? Now a few features and lots of things are going to be holdovers, of course. There's uh, not everything in Viveza 3 is brand spanking new, even if it looks a little bit different. Um, so one of the nice shortcuts that I do like to use is the tab key on my keyboard. What that does is it hides the tools palettes on the left and on the right. So hit tab and it's going to hide your tools palette. Um, another way of doing that, if you will, manually is by clicking the little triangle that's to um, the right side of this left-hand side panel. And that's going to hide um, that tools palette. Now I personally like to work this way because um, you know, I like the presets open when I wanna click on them and use them, but I like having a little bit more interface space for our, our image. And so I'll go ahead and hide that. If for some reason you wanted to hide the right-hand side image, I'm sorry, the right-hand side um, tools palette, you can do the same. There's a little triangle there. That's, that's basically the same as just tapping the tab key on your keyboard. Um, now, with that, Let's sort of run through our different tools within our tools palette. I'm not gonna show you every single thing um, in the interface. I, we unfortunately don't have time. We're already 15 minutes into the webinar and we haven't even talked about the tools palettes yet, but you do have your nice loop functionality and you can pin that loop as well. So if uh, so, the loop follows your cursor around, follows your mouse around uh, as you uh, move your mouse over the image so you can see things pretty close up, right? Zoomed into full resolution. Um, you can also pin that. So if there's an important portion of the image that you wanted to focus on with that loop function, 
uh, you can go ahead and do that. Let's go to the top left of the building. Boy, that's not sharp at all, is it? I just realized that. Anyways, um, as I pinned it, now as I move my mouse around, my uh, loop function doesn't move or change. If you want to unpin, you just click that little pin button that's in the lower right corner of the loop, similar um, to previous versions. It's just in the upper right corner now. Uh, we have a nice histogram here. The histogram is broken into your red, green, and blue channels, right? Shows them all or shows them individually. So you can get a sense of what's happening within each of those channels. Um, RGB would be red, green, and blue for those of you not familiar. I mean, that one, most folks are probably familiar with that already. Uh, L is the luminance channel. And it's nice because you can you can see what your the tones are within the image separately, if you will, from your um, RGB. Okay. Now, one other feature that, that is built into this new version of the software are um, basically clipped shadow tool and the clipped highlight tool. And if you turn those on, that's going to indicate any shadows that are without detail. And as I sort of toggle this on and off, you can see the statue on the far left side, um, that indicator pops up. And what that's telling us is that those are shadows that have no detail in them. That is, the, the tone is so dark, it's it's black with no detail. Um, so that's an important thing to know, and it's really quite nice. Uh, right now, we don't have any highlights that are totally blown out, but I bet you if I go into my brightness slider and I start uh, bringing that slider to the right, you can get a sense of um, the colors that are going out of gamut or being clipped um, outside of our sort of history, outside of our range of tones. So um, that is on right now. If I go ahead and click the, it, it is disconcerting to see sometimes, like if you didn't, if you don't realize it's on, then it's on and you see this, you're gonna think your image is messed up. It's not, it's just, it's an indicator system that lets you know, um, you know, what tones are out of, um, are being clipped. Very common tool nowadays. So. I'll keep moving. Now, I'm gonna hide the loop, I'm gonna hide the histogram. We're gonna move into our uh, global adjustments. I don't think I really need to cover these all that much um, because they're mostly straightforward and we're going to be talking about them as we sort of jump into some image processing, but they are the same for the most part. Global adjustments are the same. Brightness, contrast, saturation, structure, shadow adjustments, warmth, red, green, blue, and hue. All of those were within the previous version of Viveza, and all of them are sort of standard image processing sliders and tools. Um, for folks who are brand new to the Nick collection, the structure tool, structure is basically a texture adjustment. Um, if I, it's hard to see what's happening on this image um, because we're zoomed so far out, but it's a really great capability for being able to increase structure, texture, which is going to direct the viewer's attention towards those areas that have increased structure, or it'll push the viewer's attention away if you remove structure, right? So um, global adjustments, I've just closed that down by clicking on our little carrot there on the right side. Uh, white balance, so white balance has some interesting capabilities to it. Um, if you wanna use the white balance tool, make sure that it's checked on. It is checked off by default, um, and that's so if you go in and you make an adjustment or something, um, you, you know, it has to be checked on for it to do anything. Uh, it's, I, I tripped up on that the first few times that I was using this software. I was like, what is this thing even doing? Nothing. And then I realized that I never turned the checkbox on. So I had to turn that guy back on or right on. So uh, you have a temperature slider. And then you also have a color picker here. And that color picker allows you to adjust your white balance. For, for those of you who are using the Nick plugins as a plugin from PhotoLab or Photoshop or whatever you're raw processing, you probably won't need to use this all that much for corrective purposes. You probably will set your white balance within your raw processor. For anyone using this software as a standalone, this is a great added tool to have. Um, and the color picker basically allows you to click on that little eyedropper you can change the radius of your um, color picker, and then we can go in and choose a particular color. Now, this is sunset, so none of my colors are, should necessarily be neutral. We, we probably want the colors to be skewing a little warm, but if I go and I click on something that maybe should be neutral, I'll click on that, and you'll actually see a shift in color. So that change the white balance so that that's, if you will, corrected to the thing that I clicked on. Watch what happens if I click on the wrong thing. 
right? So this can be used for uh, creative purposes for sure. If you um, if you want to use something like that. Now, I don't. I don't want to use this at this point. We're going to turn it off, and uh, we're going to move into our control points. So the selective adjustments section here. Let's go ahead and hide white balance. Um, looks a little bit different than it was within the previous version, and I'll tell you the the added adjustment slider, not adjustment sliders, the added control that you have over control points um, is immense. It's something that people have been asking for for a long, long time. So let's talk about this. I'm going to click the control point, the add control point button. I'm going to place a control point in the sky. And let's let's just take a look at this. The first thing that you'll notice uh, is that we have uh, our control point. That looks pretty sort of normal or regular for folks who are, are accustomed to and have used control points before. Um, and then we just have one slider, right? And that one slider corresponds with the area of influence. It's the size of the area that the control point uh, could be selecting, right? So um, control points for anyone who aren't, aren't familiar, these are, in my mind, the, the most important aspect of the Nikka collection, the ability to target a certain area or a certain object let the software do all of the manual labor and making the selection and our adjustments, we get very clean, very um, photographic looking adjustments utilizing control points as opposed to maybe other selective tools like a brush tool, which oftentimes looks like you've, you've brushed something in or you've cut something out and brushed it, which is fine. That works for all sorts of different situations. It's a great feature and tool to have. But here we have a different way of making our selections. You literally place the point on the object you want to adjust, size your area to encompass the area that you want to adjust or object. And then from there, if you follow my cursor, we're within the selective adjustments tool section. And um, we have all of our basic adjustments. So everything we had globally, we have selectively. Brightness, contrast, saturation, structure, shadows, red, green, warm, or red, green, blue. And we also have um, and I'm just realizing that I skipped over this with global adjustments, but we have the ability to adjust highlights, midtones, shadows, and blacks. So all of these values, these brightness levels, can be independently adjusted with control points. So this is brand new and it's huge. It's very important. Um, the the other thing that's really cool, and I want to talk a lot about how this is working. We have control over. Um, how the control point is making the selection. So we have color selectivity. Um, and so that would be pertaining to our control points. And we're able to adjust based upon the brightness level, that's the luminance, and then the way the color is on the object or area that you're working within, and that's chrominance. And um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how that's working on some other images. For now, let's just sort of run with a, a basic set of adjustments that I might do to this image. I'm going to take this control point. I'm going to go over to the brightness slider. I'm going to start bringing this down, right? If I bring it too far down, it's going to look funky. It's going to look weird. And what I want to do is start to direct your attention as the viewer into the areas that I think are important photographically, right? So I want to direct your attention and your eye. And in this case, to do that, I'm going to add a little bit of saturation in the sky here, and I'm going to just darken these tones down a little bit here. Now, once I've finished with my first control point, making the adjustments that I might want to, in fact, let's see what happens. if Maybe I don't adjust the brightness so much, but rather I adjust my selective. Eh, it's probably pretty similar, maybe not exactly the same, but um, we'll, we'll get into those selective tones in a bit. Now, Let's say we've finished making our adjustments for that control point. We're ready to move on to another area. What you'll do is you'll just move back into the control points button. So this is the add control point button. Click on it and then go and add the control point to the area, right? And in this case, what I'm gonna do is sort of match, not with color, but kind of with tone, um, the sky over here as well. So I've placed the control point. I'm gonna move over into my uh, selective adjustment sliders. In this case, I'm going to brighten. I'm going to add a little bit of contrast. And you know what? Let's let's warm that section of the sky up rather than leaving it cool. So I'll take the warmth slider and I'll just warm it up a little bit. And so that's that's going to start to kind of match uh, the other side a little bit more. 
my my favorite part, and I know that this this probably sounds a little bit strange. My absolute favorite part of control points is the fact that in Viveza is the fact that we have the ability to adjust red, green, blue individually. And now I'm starting to pair those kinds of capabilities with highlights, midtones, and shadows. Now, these sliders seem maybe overzealous or a little bit strange to have in here, but we just warmed up that sky. It looks pretty good. But looking at it, this area here, this area looks a little bit more magenta. And so what we can do is just go into our green slider, remove a little bit of green, and that's gonna add magenta over to the left side of the image there where that control point is. And now those colors match a little bit more. Now, I, I know, like, that, it's, it's just, this gives me this, this crazy amount of control um, over exactly what's happening within the image. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Like, the fact that we have the ability to adjust um, the, the individual colors as well as the individual sort of brightness sections or um, its selective sort of tones and I'm going to leave the top portion of the image a little bit cooler. Anyways, let's keep moving. I could talk your ear off about exactly why I'm doing all of these adjustments, but note what we're doing here is I'm trying to direct your attention as the viewer through um, the, the image a little bit more. And so I want to direct your attention towards the New York Museum because that's what the picture is of with um, this nice reflection in the reflection or reflecting pool. Um, green, I need to remove green here. There we go. And then I'm just gonna take a control point. I'm moving a little bit quicker because I, I wanna get through this image and I wanna make sure that we finish the image. It's a little structure in our reflection and that's going to uh, be really quite nice. And then I'm just gonna darken down this corner over here. So I'm quickly working, dropping control points, um, adding some contrast, and then I'm gonna duplicate this control point and place it over here. And for those of you who are familiar with the previous versions, you, you do it basically the same way. In, the, in my mind, the fastest way to duplicate a control point so we get the same adjustment in a different part of the image is to hold the Option key down if you're on a Mac or Alt if you're on a PC. I'm on a Mac, so I'm gonna hold the Option key down. And while I'm holding Option, click on the control point, drag it away, that's gonna give us a duplicate. And voila, now I've darkened down that corner and edge a little bit. Let's maybe do the same thing to the reflection of the building. I don't know if I need one over here. So let's say I don't want this last control point. I don't need it because it's dark enough over there. Um, what we can do is just move over to the right-hand side of the interface and delete it. So by clicking the little trash can button here on the right side, you can get rid of it, and it's going to ask, are you sure you want to delete? I'm going to say yes. gets rid of it. Um, I'm just realizing that maybe I've darkened those tones a little more than I want to, so I'm going to highlight all of them, and then I'm just gonna back that off a little. Okay, so let's say we're done processing this image. We're happy with where we are right now. Let's take a look at the before and after. So to do that, you move up into the compare section or the um, different view sections here in the top toolbar. And if you press and hold the compare button, you'll see the original image. And as I let go of the compare button, you'll see the enhanced image, right? There's a split preview. So this just looks a little bit different, but it works exactly the same way as it did within uh, the previous version. And then um, also there's a side-by-side -side preview. I'll hit tab, I'm gonna click the little twirler button that's in between the two images. And now what you're seeing is on the left side of the image is the original and on the right side is the enhanced, right? So I've sort of dodged the center of the image a little bit to direct your attention towards the center. And I've burned down the corners a little bit and, sort of directed your eye using some color contrast um, on the New York Museum and in the background. Anyways, we're all done editing our image. I'm gonna tap that tab key one more time, and we're gonna apply these adjustments. So um, to when we're all done processing the photograph, you move into the lower right corner of the interface, you click the apply button or, or cancel if you wanted to cancel out, uh, but you click the apply button and then Viveza will process the image all at once for us and that'll bring us back into our host piece of software, in this case, Photo Lab, and uh, will allow us to continue on with our process, our workflow. So, um, you know, in the film strip down here, you've got the original image, and then we've got the enhanced image. My computer sounds like it's gonna take off or something right now. So uh, I'm not sure why that is, because I don't have much other software running. 
but uh, let's uh, let's risk it all and jump over into Photoshop, right? So I'll show you how to launch the software from Photoshop. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Nick selected tool here, and let's we're going to create a preset in this case with this image. So um, the uh, Nick selected tool here is one of the ways that you access the Nick collection here within Photoshop. Uh, mine was sort of minimized for the so that I could access using the icons. Um, we're going to open that by clicking the little two boxes that are within the Nick selected tool there. And uh, this is going to allow us to read each of the different uh, pieces of software titles. Now, um, I'm, I just opened this this way because I wanted to show you a couple things. First of all, there's a message center here. So um, should you open the software and um, there's a, a great new update or message or um, maybe there's an upcoming webinar or something like that, you can get that message right here, which is really quite nice. Um, and right now this is saying, do you need help? Click here for the user guide, right? So they make it very simple so that you can um, find any of the help you might need. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out here are these meta presets. So these are a really cool new feature that are built into uh, the Photoshop version of the Nick collection, which allows you to um, have presets that uh, utilize more than one of the Nick collection at a time, right? So this tool, Adoxical, uh, this preset or meta preset, uh, uses HDR Effects Pro and Silver Effects. And that's what these little icons are telling you. Um, and it probably doesn't matter which tools. I, it is really pretty and it's a nice indicator. But what, what happens is, you know, you try these out, you just click on, let, I'll just click on a doxical just to show you what happens. I know we're not talking about, um, we're, we're supposed to be talking about Viveza, but I'm just gonna show you what happens here. If you click on that, um, that meta preset, it runs the preset that it works within HDR. So, sorry, let me rephrase this. Um, we opened a doxical and that particular meta preset utilizes HDR effects pro and it utilizes Silver Effects Pro. And uh, what it's trying to do is uh, run those processes as a preset, but without us having to even open the software up. So this is really quite nice because we can just click on it and we get that preset, right? And it's utilizing a doxical in this case, which is HDR Effects Pro and Viveza, I'm sorry, and Silver Effects, and you don't have to do any of the work and you get that look, which is pretty darn cool. And there's 10 of them that are built into the software now as a sort of starting point. And what I would imagine is sort of the, one of the directions that uh, we're gonna be moving in uh, from or within the collection. Anyways, I wanted to show that I'm excited about those. and I've been using them quite a lot. Um, just cause I like the looks. I, I, I created several of them and I, I created images or, or meta presets that I thought I would use figuring that other people would probably want to use those same ones. Anyways, here within Photoshop, we're gonna click on the Viveza 3 button in the Nick Selected tool. A uh, very similar process to what happened within Photolab, um, except in Photolab, we duplicated our file. In the Photoshop version of the Nick collection, you're duplicating the background layer by default, and you are working in a non-destructive process because you can always go back to your original um, background layer. So we've got our presets here. What we're gonna do is actually create our own custom preset. So if you follow my cursor in the lower left corner, um, I actually, I didn't delete this preset and I meant to before the webinar because this is the preset that we're gonna create right now together. Um, but it gives me an excuse to jump into the custom presets and tell you about what these other buttons are doing. So uh, there's there are kind of five things you can do on a single preset here. You can favorite that preset by clicking on the little star that's to the left of the particular preset. You can actually click on the image itself. So this is a what's called a sort of heads up display or a quick display of what your image would look like if you click on the preset. So if I were to click on it, it applies the preset. Um, I'm gonna go back one step. Uh, and then the other three things that you can do are export your presets. So should you create a preset and you want it on a different computer or you want to share it with friends or share it on Reddit or your website or wherever, um, you can export your presets by clicking that button. The middle button looks like a little redo, allows you to update your preset. So if you make changes to it, you can update it or you can delete it. That's what we're going to do here. I'm just going to go ahead and delete that preset 
and let's just recreate it. So I'm gonna go ahead and just hide the uh, preset browser for now. We're gonna move over to the right side of the interface and we're gonna create a high key preset. It's a common preset that, or a common sort of uh, way of processing that I use uh, if I have an image that maybe I purposefully underexposed or even accidentally underexposed and I wanted to bring up the brightness or create a high key image. Um, and, and so to do that, we're basically gonna brighten the photograph and also add a little contrast for some pop, right? Especially this image, it's underexposed and it's in a um, very sort of open lighting condition. So there isn't a lot of pop or contrast. Um, and so we could brighten and adjust contrast using our brightness and contrast adjustment sliders. But instead of doing that, we're gonna go ahead and make some changes to our curve. So we'll move into our levels and curves. We're gonna adjust the RGB values, so all, all three channels at once. And I'm just gonna go ahead and kind of, um, in the upper sort of right quadrant or eighth, right now it's not even close to an eighth. Um, so in our quarter tones, these, these bright values here, I'm gonna click on our level, or sorry, our curve, and I'm gonna go ahead and drop a point, and I'm gonna drag that upward. That's gonna give us a brighter image, basically overall. It's flattening out some of these tones, but it's brightening and adding some contrast uh, to the rest of the curve. I'm gonna add a little more contrast by moving into the lower uh, left section here, and I'm gonna go ahead and just pull that down a little. There we go. And then I'll go ahead and just take our midpoint. I'm gonna pull that back up just a touch. It's gonna create a slightly brighter midtone, um, and therefore overall we have a brighter image. Now, um, when I'm creating personal presets uh, for, for anything, if I'm going to use curves, I'm use, usually a little, uh, I, don't, I don't make a dramatic curve adjustment if my uh, application, if my preset is something that's supposed to be broad. That is, because I'm gonna be using all sorts of different kinds of images, um, to, to make high key with this preset, I'm gonna be a little bit more subtle with my curve. And I probably, I'm gonna utilize the selective tone sliders and my brightness adjustment a little more. Um, sort of use them, using them in tandem, if you will. So um, the thing about a high key image is usually we attempt to uh, maintain highlight detail. So it might make sense to just take highlights and midtones and shadows and bring them all to the right, right? Sure, that's gonna create a very high key image. But um, I wanna try to, again, make a general preset that's gonna work on a lot of different photographs. So the first thing I wanna do is not pull up my preset or my highlights and midtones all that much. Um, and I do wanna slide my blacks and my shadows a little bit up, but I, I wanna be a little bit more subtle, again, because we're creating a general preset. But by having these four sliders, highlights, midtones, and uh, shadows and blacks, this is, these are gonna be the kinds of things that you adjust on your image that you click on the, click or apply the preset to. So these are really powerful sliders that allow us to individually adjust those sections. Um, I think I'm harping on that, I probably don't need to, but long story short, uh, those are going to do a bit of the heavy lifting for our preset, right? Uh, now, whenever I'm brightening an image, um, oftentimes I actually am gonna need to add saturation to an underexposed image. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and actually reduce the saturation. Um, and, and that's because it's just going to look a little bit better on this particular image um, because the color balance was a little bit off. Uh, anyways, let's take a look at what we've got. So we've got our original image, we've got our photo now that's you know a little bit brighter, a little bit, I consider that sort of high key-ish now. We could probably push it a little bit further by adding a little bit of brightness. And let's say we really love this. We wanna be able to apply this on different images. Let's save it, save it as a preset. So we're gonna click the save preset button. It's down in the lower right corner, it's highlighted in gold for us. And when you click that, it's gonna ask us for a new name, a preset name, right? And I'm just gonna name it high key, cool. And um, I don't have any control points on this photograph, but should we want to save control points into our uh, preset, you just click on that little checkbox and it does it for you. 
saves your control points. So that's a nice added feature as well. We're gonna click save. Now, anytime I wanna use uh, our high key preset, it's gonna show up within the custom section of the interface now. So um, I'll, I'll show you that. Let's click the apply button. So we're all done creating our preset. Let's move on to our next image. And um, we've got our high key image. Oh, so again, what's happening here, I'm gonna pull my layers palette out here in Photoshop. So uh, in the layers palette here, you've got your original background layer. And then we have, I'll go ahead and reveal our Viveza three layer. Um, and again, what's happening here is it duplicates the original background and then applies our adjustments to uh, the duplicated background layer. And I wanted to point that out so folks who are brand new see what's happening. All right, let's close that image. I don't need to save it. Let's jump into this photograph. So this is an image that I, I already processed a little bit with Color Effects Pro. I did some skin softening. I used Dark and Light and Center, some of the some of the my favorite um, filters within Color Effects Pro. Uh, let's jump into Viveza 3 because we've got to talk more about control points. And I want to show you or talk you through how some of the um, new capabilities work within control points. Before I do that, follow my cursor to the lower left corner of the interface. I'm going to click on the word custom here. And again, I don't think it's going to work in this case, but if I wanted to apply the high key preset, it's, it's going to be there in the custom section. Uh, or, and this was a fun preset to kind of fiddle around with and make uh, the, the color IR preset. It's just a little bit funky. So it's supposed to be emulating um, infrared color photography, false color infrared. It's not real, but um, anyways, it's fun. I love the fact that now I can just sort of create and play within Viveza, save it, and then I can come back and see what happens with those exact same adjustments on a different photo. It's definitely fun. It, that's one of the things that I love about you know, getting new software basically is a whole new way of thinking. There's a whole new uh, set of tools and capabilities that we have access to now. Here's some of those. Let's 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 play here. I'm going to zoom in. Um, let's zoom in one to three. Eh, this is a raw, small file. Let's go one to two. So we're zoomed in pretty well, so we can see her eyes. And what we're going to do is use control points to actually change the color of her eye. Now. Will you use this exact technique? I don't know, probably not. It's very specific, but it will show us a little more of the capability and it's a, a good way for me to illustrate how um, these, these new re, like selection refinement adjustments are, are able to be made. So uh, let's go ahead and just zoom way in, one to one. Let's go ahead. So um, I placed the control point on her eye. And then what we're gonna do is use the uh, color adjust, this tool here, that's built into each individual control point, right? So this guy, color picker, um, allows us to do two things. We can click on the eyedropper tool, and then we can click on a color in the image, and what's gonna happen when I click on this red of her lips is the control point that I placed in her eye, all of the sliders in the control point will adjust to try to match that color that I clicked on. Right, so I've clicked on her lip, and you can see the control point is doing its best to kind of um, make those colors happen. Right, it's kind of neat. All right, we don't want that. I'm going to hit Command Z on my keyboard. There we go. It sends back a couple steps uh, in our history, so we can redo that stuff. Um, that's using the color picker. Right, so follow my cursor back over to the right side of the interface. Um, if I use that eyedropper tool, I can choose a color within the image and the control point will try to emulate that color. If I click on this other little color swatch that's to the right of the eyedropper tool, a color picker comes up. And this is gonna look different if you're on a PC. It actually looks very different on a PC. Um, on a Mac, on with this particular operating system that I'm using, um, I can't recall, geez, if, if for some reason it escapes me. Anyways, this is the color picker on the contemporary operating system right now for uh, Mac and, um, what June of 2021. So we have the ability here to choose any color we want, right? And that's what we're going to do. And the control point is going to change the color and brightness level to whatever we we set this to. So I want her eyes to be relatively bright. I, we're going to change them to green because it's going to be crazy. Um, but anyways, 
let's click on the green that we think we want, click the OK button and say, OK, uh, is that the green that we want? Yes, cool, let's keep it. If it's not the green that we want, you just go back to that color swatch on the right side of the interface here, click on it, and you can choose a different color green. So maybe it's slightly too bright. We can go and drive that luminosity slider to the, the right a little bit, it'll darken it down. Uh, apparently it will brighten it up. Um, and what I wanna do is actually darken it down just a touch, hopefully. There we go, that's probably closer to what I want. Now, if the color isn't exactly what we want, you can always move into the sliders and make the adjustments, right? Because what that color swatch is doing and what that color picker is allowing you to do is target adjust. You look at the area in the image, you click on it, and the sliders just do it for you. Now, if it's not perfect, you make changes. In this case, I wanna actually, um, I wanna probably add a little red, which sounds weird, but it'll remove some of the cyan from her eye, and now the eye's a little bit more green. Um, and I'm happy with that. But I'm not happy with exactly where the control point is um, putting this effect, right? Now, uh, in, the, in the old way of working with older control points or, or control points that are within Viveza 2, let's say, and I'm sorry I keep referencing it for anyone who's brand new, it's just these are some of the things that are different. Um, in the old way of thinking, what you would do is you'd take another control point and you'd place that control point, this control point here, in the area that you wanted constricted or you wanted the first control point to not affect, right? And that's gonna do actually a really good job in this case to clean that up, but it doesn't always do a really good job. Um, so one of the brand new features, I'm gonna delete that um, control point that was sort of constricting the initial control point adjustments. Um, the, the new way of working is to combine that technique that I just showed you using other control points, and then also using these two new sliders, color selectivity. Um, and what this allows you to do is um, hone in or broaden the selection that's being made by that control point, right? So with the luminance and chrominance sliders, if you slide it to the left from 50%, it broadens the selection, in this case, to other brightness, other other things that the control point thinks it should be selecting that is um, further away from the initial selection that it made. So, sorry, further away in the brightness of that thing, right? So um, this is where control points kind of start to get complicated, right? The beauty of them is that you can just place the point on the object, make your adjustments, it's gonna look great. If for some reason you need to refine them, Again, you can broaden the adjustment or the selection being made by sliding the luminance to the left, or you can kind of tighten it up. You can um, tell the software that you want um, only the very closest brightness levels, luminance levels to be adjusted. And if I slide that slider all the way to the right, you can see the control point is making a much smaller selection based upon that luminance, based upon the brightness. Um, now, uh, what's cool about this, in my mind anyways, is that you can control the sort of selectivity with luminance and chrominance at the same time. So if I needed to, I could broaden out the selection that the control point is making by sliding chrominance to the left or slide it to the right and it's gonna hone in on that color. So um, what I'm finding, and again, like this is, this is relatively new for me as well, um, what I'm finding is that there's kind of a balance, and usually the 50-50 works pretty well to make the best selection that I think it can make, um, but sometimes you wanna adjust that away from 50. And what, what I'm finding tends to be the case, because the control points do such a good job initially, um, is that I don't have to slide those sliders too far. You can, but you don't really have to most of the time. Now, I've sort of explained what's happening there. Let's Let's actually take a look at the difference of those selections. In fact, I'm going to double click on luminance and I'm gonna double click on chrominance. And Lori, I just realized it's 352. I could talk about these control points for a lot longer and I'm going to, I need to finish this point, but um, I just realized that we're coming up on time. Time sure flies, right? So follow my cursor to control points. I'm gonna click on this little uh, grayed out box. It's a little square with a circle in it. And that's going to display the selection that the control point is making, right? 
you can change the selection numerous ways. You can move the control point, and by moving the control point, the, it looks at, assesses the situation, and then makes the selection a different way. You can move, and then you can also size your area of influence, which is going to change um, the area that's being affected by the control point, right, based upon encompassing other pixels. And then um, the other brand new thing is that you can go ahead and adjust the color selectivity, right? So we can see this happening live when we click our luminance slider and I start sliding it to the right, right? Now, um, I hesitate to tell you to open this feature every time, right? Because we're, we're gonna wanna, what I tend to want to do is make the selection be as precise as it possibly can be. The problem that we run into there is that we're not letting the control point um, you know, have its own creative license, if you will. Uh, you, we're not letting the control point do its work, and that is it creates a photographic looking selection, right? So, you know, I would be careful utilizing these sliders, but what we're looking at right now is how to more precisely control what the control points are actually making a selection of using the luminance and chrominance sliders here. Again, if you slide either of the sliders to the right, it zeroes in on the specific color and tone and color, or sorry, tone and color that you put the control point on. If you slide the slider to the left, it broadens out its selection. Okay, that will come, if you haven't already gotten familiar with that and use that, play with it, see what happens. Also play with um, the hide and show selection checkbox, right? It's this, it's again, the little grayed out box that is um, to the right of the percentage that you're gonna see here. By the way, the percentage that you see there, it's very small on my screen. I forgot to actually adjust my resolution here. Um, it says five. What that's telling you is the area that the control point is covering, right? If you make adjustments to the size of the area of influence, it's going to make adjustments to um, that percentage. Okay, so I like what's happening. We've zoned in or, or honed in on our selection a little bit. Um, let's go ahead and change the color of her other eye as well. And then the other cool thing that we can do, ladies and gentlemen, as we always could do when utilizing the Nick collection from Photoshop, is you can brush the effect in, right? So some folks are gonna just kind of prefer, especially making like these very dramatic adjustments to the color of the eye, might just prefer um, brushing this stuff in. In fact, let's do that. Let's. I'm gonna delete this control point. Delete now. So we did a pretty good job making the selection and adjustment here. I'm gonna go ahead and actually broaden that out a touch more because if we're gonna brush it in, it doesn't need to be as precise. I want it to be pretty precise, but it doesn't have to be perfectly precise. Okay, so um, usually we would click the apply button in the lower right corner. Here in the Photoshop version, there's also a brush tool. And um, again, it's a different capability. You use the control points to make your initial adjustments to apply the effects where you want them to be. And then if you want to, you can go in and you can uh, brush the effect exactly where you want them to be. So um, here within the Nick selected tool, it has changed and we now have access to a brush. And um, what I wanna do is change the size of my brush and kind of brush that just into her iris, right? And now we're changing just the color of her eyes very, very quickly. And without need for really, um, uh, you know, having to make precise selections because the control points do the initial work for us and then we can just brush the effect in exactly where we want it. I'm gonna click the apply button. We're gonna zoom out. I should have actually, oops, I should have actually zoomed out. Um, why is my computer, oh, there we go. While we were still within Viveza because sometimes what happens is we make these really, you know, aggr not aggressive, but um, strong adjustments, and um, I think I've overdone it a little bit with her eyes, but you see the point, which is the important facet. Okay, Lori, I'm gonna be quiet now and take any questions we possibly have time for. I just realized that, you know, we're kind of going over time. Sorry. <laughs> You're having so much fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. Um, well, actually, I have two, two questions about control points. Uh, one, Sonia was asking, can you still group control points? Yes, you can, yep. And it works the exact same way. Um, I'll, I, I can show you that. I can actually take another question while this is launching, because I'll just launch the image in Viveza. We'll talk about grouping control points. What's okay, the and one? then 
another one would be in the same area uh, duplicating a control point. Mm -hmm. Let's go through both of those things. So that you, you have the capability of doing both of those things as you sort of normally would. I'm gonna fit this to screen. Let's um, give the image, I don't think that's actually gonna do anything, but um, okay, control points. All right, so um, let's say we dropped a control point in the sky here, and uh, we were actually gonna use maybe two control points, and we wanted them to be grouped, and maybe we, turns out we might need more than just two. So. Um, first thing we're going to do is group them together, uh, and to do that, I I need to highlight them. I need to uh, enable both of them. There's a few ways of doing that. Uh, I can actually click on the control points uh, over here in the palette, so over in the control points list. If I hold the shift key down, I can click on those control points. Um, I can uh, sort of do it the same way I would have within the previous version in that I can click anywhere that's not on my control point and drag, click and drag, and you get this bounding box. So just click not on a control point and drag your cursor, drag your mouse, encompass your control points. That is going to enable um, you to highlight them, just like what we did with the control points list. Um, and then what we would do is group them. So uh, to, to group control points, uh, you can use the shortcut Command G on your Mac, or yeah, or Control G on a PC, um, or you can move over into your Control Points list and you can click um, on this second icon from the left. It looks like a little folder with the Control Points, and by clicking on it, it groups them. Now, let's say we wanted to duplicate that Control Point. Uh, you can do that the same way we did earlier in the webinar. That is, you can hold the Option key down click on your control point you wish to duplicate and drag it away so option click and drag um, and then you can also um, click on this sorry that's activated you can click on this but button here and this is going to duplicate any selected control points um, which is the same as hitting command d and so this is a duplicate as well you're not seeing any adjustments made because i didn't do anything to the control points but um now we have a group. These two control points are grouped, and then these other control points are just duplicates in their blank. Cool. Is there any more questions, Lori? Uh, just one, one final one, just because yeah. a couple people have asked this. Um, they were wondering, what is your quick rule of thumb when you would use Vivesa versus Color Effects? Oh. Well, shoot. Um, So Viveza, in my mind, is is for uh, dodging and burning, right? Selectively lightening and toning certain, or lightening or darkening certain areas within the image. So it gives you lots and lots of control over saying, okay, you know, this part of the image is too uh, dark, so I'm going to go and brighten this up, right? And uh, this area is too bright, so I'm going to go ahead and darken that down. And so I use Viveza and dodging and burning to direct the viewer's attention through the image before, typically before I would go into um, the, the um, color effects software. Now, the thing to think about too is that in Viveza, we now have the ability to um, use control points to change all of these things as well as highlights, midtones, shadows, blacks, and whites, or blacks. And, and so because of that, I might use it as a finishing touch um, after I use Color Effects Pro. So I don't, I don't think I'm actually even giving a very good answer. I'm trying to think through when I would use one over the other. Um, Color Effects Pro is it's 55 different filters. And I find myself consistently using maybe 12 of them. I play with all of them when I can. Um, but I probably use, you know, 12-ish of them. And usually my own thought process is to use the raw processor to get the image as close as I can to finished in the raw processor. And then probably I would go into Viveza to selectively dodge and burn. And then I would move into color effects for the filters. But um, I don't use Viveza every single image, and I don't use color effects on every single image. So 
hopefully that answers that. I feel like I'd sort of beat around the bush. I'm sorry. No, that's good. <laughs> uh, Dan, I want to thank you again for a fantastic presentation. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you close out. And thanks again, everybody, for watching today. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. Uh, you know, I get excited when we get to play with these new pieces of software. Hopefully you found the webinar to be beneficial. Anyways, have an absolutely lovely weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Come on back to as many of these webinars as you'd like to. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see you again. So hopefully I will. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.